All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Hopefully with a nice uh, belly full of breakfast burritos that were out there. Mighty delicious. Smothered mine with a little hot sauce. So that was a good time. I'm telling you, it's a, it's a, I'm, I'm glad this new tradition has started here to kick off this year. But we're glad that you're here at Grace Community Church. Whether you're a first-time guest, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Regular attender, welcome back. We're always uh, happy to see your faces here and uh, catch up on how the week went. So there's a few things we're going to go over in the bulletin uh, that hopefully you got when you walked in. Uh, but uh, one is the communication card. This is a way for us to communicate, uh, but also to keep up on what's going on in your life. Uh, what are some things that we should be praying for in your life? Uh, regular attenders, this is where you can let us know if you've moved, uh, if there's a new addition to your family, anything like that. Fill it out here, a prayer request. Uh, many in the church, uh, at the church office, love to uh, pray for our body and lift those requests up to our Lord and Savior. Uh, if you're new, this is a way for us to get to know you. We'd love to get to know you. So please fill this out. Uh, you could put on the back of who you are a little bit, and then when you walk through here, uh, through these doors on to the right uh, is a welcome center desk. Hand that over, and we'd love to connect you, get you into this body, into this Grace Community Church family that we have here. So we, you know, like to plug in. Church here is more than just Sunday. There's uh, Wednesday things. There's other stuff going on, and that's all. And can come to the church. There'll be a little uh, uh, devotional and brunch, and then go serve other women in the church, whether it be cleaning. Uh, helping to organize, and also just catching up, fellowship. Uh, so great time for the women to serve uh, there. So when you walk out these doors to the left, that's where you can sign up. Let, it, let the church know on your communication card that you might be interested as well. So running alongside that, you know, if the women are going off and, and helping to serve there, you know, there might be some kiddos left behind here that need some help. So the dads and the fathers can go up to Eastman Lake. That's a flyer in your bulletin. Uh, there will be some activities, uh, some music, and some fun happening there at Eastman Lake. So take a chance of that opportunity there as well. Uh, April 17th, so not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, won a Grand Prix. It's a time, I mean, I remember it when I was a kid. That was a super fun uh, event, having my race car go down, never winning. But it was all about racing and eating nachos. So uh, come out. Uh, Come celebrate our kids that are in Awana. Cheer them on. They've spent a lot of time helping to design those cars to look super cool, uh, make them fast. I know that they would really enjoy having uh, the church here help celebrate with them as well. So come on to that. Uh, April 26th, Men of Integrity Retreat. So that's quickly approaching. That's uh, $280. If you're still interested in going but haven't signed up or paid yet, uh, you could talk with Sean Garcia. His contact is in. Uh, the bulletin. You can let the church know as well. Uh, and uh, if you are not able to go, but you'd like to sponsor men, there's still opportunities to do a scholarship. There's a lot of stuff going to, towards the men at the rescue mission that they would love uh, to be able to go. So take, uh, take those opportunities as well. And as always, following up that uh, retreat is always the men's steak night. So that'll be happening here at Grace Community Church as well. Tickets are for sale. Uh, so there are $15 for your steak dinner. Uh, again, it will be here. Uh, Butch has tickets. Uh, you can also use the app. So you can scan that QR code up there. Uh, David Vickery, you know, several weeks ago showed us how to use that app. Uh, you can buy tickets on there as well uh, or reach out to Butch for those. Uh, next week, they'll be available in the foyer as well uh, to purchase. So Lots of, again, great things happening in the bulletin. Take note of those. Put them in your phone. Uh, put them on your calendars, maybe on your refrigerator. Uh, but there's a, a lot happening, which is great. Again, part of the Grace Community Church family here. So with that, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to a special video. Hello, Grace Community Church. This is Mark and Sela, part of the Lacaz family. And we are in? Chiang Mai, Thailand. Chiang Mai. And we are ready for something very exciting. What are we ready for? For you to se send a team. We are ready for you to send a team. When should they come? In September. Yes. And? What will they do here? Great question. The team will join us as we minister to the orphans, as we teach English at the university, um, as we engage with our local Thai churches and help them do outreach through teaching of English. 
Uh, the team will also prayer walk the city with us, go to the Buddhist temples and pray at site, on site there, and, um, and do some other things that we, we've got going on. If someone is interested, who should they talk to? Jacob and Anna Lopez. Talk to Jacob and Anna or talk to anyone on the mission team. We would love to see you in September. Until then, please keep us in prayer. Uh, keep faithfully giving to Faith Promise. And we will see you soon. God Bye. bless. Bye. Well, good morning. Um, I'm Corey, and I'm on the, the missions team, and I want to talk to you about the, the trip. Um, it's going to be happening this September. We're really excited about it. We haven't been able to send a team. We've had individuals, but not as a team, do missions. And so it's been since uh, 19 is the last time we were able to. COVID kind of knocked us off our feet. But we're excited about that. The causes are going to be hosting us. Um, I'm if anybody's interested, we'd love to have you do it. It's going to be September, probably around the 7th to the 8th. It's a two-week mission trip. Um, it's going to be um, one of those things where we're working with their church and assorted churches and being able to do things that are put you out of your, your normal mode. But for those who are qualified... So the question is, are you qualified? So if you work with the youth or have worked with the youth or work with a WANA, I think you're qualified. If you like to share your, your testimony with others, do street evangelism, you're qualified. If you've ever taken a class with Tony on how to share your faith, you're qualified. So there's opportunities for you. The main thing is, are you willing to take two weeks out of your life to go overseas. Um, my children through the youth group went to uh, Brazil and they went to Panama, at least one of them did. And it changed their life. It made a totally difference of how they saw their world. And um, I know we can share our faith here, but over there it kind of puts you out there and you have to trust the Lord. Uh, this is not a vacation. This is a ministry. So we want you to have a heart of serving. You are there going to somebody, somebody else's culture. You can't be the rich American coming in. You are there to minister to others. So if you're wanting to do that, we'd love to have you meet us. I'll be in the back afterwards if you want to talk to me. Um, we need to have a people who are healthy because it's going to be an active group. So be willing to be there and put yourself out. Uh, lastly, uh, everybody just stand up and we're going to start worship. Mm -hmm. I want to sing a song for you, Lord. Lord, you, I want to sing a song. Listen to the angels sing along Song of your faithfulness Song of your grace And of your love and kindness To the glory of your name With everything that's in me, Lord Listen to me say I want to sing a song for you I want to sing a song I want to live my life for you, Lord. Lord, for you, I want to live my life. And I want to praise the name of Jesus. Pray above all things you're glorified. Song of your gratefulness. Song of your grace. And of your love and kindness to the glory of your name. And everything that's in me, Lord, listen to me say, I want to sing a song for you. I want to sing a song. And I 
sing about your mercy And I'll sing about your love Your goodness, Lord Your tightness You want to sing the song of your faithfulness song of your grace And of your love and kindness To the glory of your name And everything that's in me, Lord Listen to me say I want to sing a song for you I want to sing a song Song of your faithfulness, yeah. Of your love and kindness to the glory of your name. Everything that's in the Lord, listen to me say. I want to sing a song for you. I want to sing a song. We'll sing holy, holy.
washed away. I say, find their way at the sound of your great name. All condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every fear has no place at the sound. Your great name, the enemy, he has to be at the sound of your great name, Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us, Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. All the world will praise your great name. All the weak find their strength at the sound of your great name. All the sick in the hear at the sound of your great name. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. And all the world will praise your great name. Your great name. Jesus. No higher name than Jesus. No sweeter name than Jesus. Let's sing that again. Jesus. No higher name than Jesus. No sweeter name than Jesus. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up, and all the world will praise Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. Son of God and Your great name, your great name. Please be seated. As the men come forward, the scripture for today is Deuteronomy 15.10. Please give to him and don't have a stingy heart when you give. Because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you do. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you with hearts filled with gratitude for the abundant blessings you give us each day. We acknowledge that cheerful giving is not an obligation but a joyful act of worship. 
Help us understand that our giving is an expression of our deep love for you and our want to further your kingdom here on earth. Amen. All the weak find their strength at the sound of your great name. Sick are healed, dead are raised at the sound of your great name. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up, and all the world will praise your great name, your great name, Jesus, no higher name than Jesus. No sweeter name than Jesus. Jesus. No higher name than Jesus. No sweeter name than Jesus. Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. And all the world will praise your great name. All right, well, good morning. Thank you for being here with us today as we celebrate what the Lord is doing in our lives and has done. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 3. And uh, if you're new here with us for the first time, I uh, just wanted to give you a couple things that our church feels passionately about. The first is that we are committed to preaching and teaching the Word of God. We believe that the Bible is God's inspired Word for us, that through God's Holy Spirit, that He has given us His very Word, that the Spirit gave to the writers of the different books, and they wrote them down, and that they have been preserved by God's Holy Spirit so that we have God's very words to us. We also believe that evangelism is important. Throughout the New Testament, we see the whole picture of what the people are doing is going around and telling people of what Jesus has done for them and how He has saved them from their sins. We believe that discipleship is important, that as we hear the word of God, that as we believe that Jesus saved us from our sins, that discipleship is the process of walking with one another as we conform our lives to be like Christ. And the final thing is that we love one another. The New Testament is a, a picture of the churches loving one another, loving their missionaries that they've sent out, loving within and without and letting that be a model of what it means to follow Christ is that we sacrificially love one another, we serve one another, and we choose to put other people before ourselves. And as Kyle said, and I've, uh, I've stolen it, and there will come a point where you guys won't even remember Kyle saying it. It'll just be my thing. But <laughs> Kyle, uh, Kyle has been saying, you know, we want to take you from friend to family as quickly as possible. You know, we, we truly believe that the church is meant to be a family, that we are to be the body of Christ. The Bible has different uh, metaphors for what the church is to be, and family is one of them. And so we want you to feel like this is your family. If you need something, if you don't have somewhere to go on a holiday, if you need anything that the church, the people of the church are like family to you. Well, as we get into... Uh, Philippians chapter 3, let me pray for us this morning. Lord, we recognize that you are all sufficient in all things and that you have given us your word that we might know you, that we might know what it means to worship you, how to serve you, how to come to know that 
Christ is our Lord and Savior, having given himself up on the cross and sacrificed for us. Lord, I'm reminded of the, the young ladies who picked up a Bible and started reading and didn't even know what they were reading, but were able to, to know that they needed to repent of their sins and put their hope in Christ. Lord, through your word alone, seeing that need for repentance. Lord, what a great treasure it is that we have your words for us. Lord, we ask that today that you would use your word as a, as a light to our life, that we would know where we're going and what we are to do because of the words that you've given us. And Lord, we pray that these words today that we look at and that we, uh, that we exposit and, and dig into would not be my words, but they would be your words through your spirit for your people on this day. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me, uh, well, let's, let's, we'll read in just a second. I wanted to, uh, to ask if you've ever seen an Olympic gold medalist bite their medal. You've seen that, right? Carolyn's like, yeah, I've seen that before. Well, they did that because a long time ago when the gold medals used to be solid gold instead of gold plated, they would bite them because teeth are harder than pure gold. And so if your teeth would leave an impression in the gold, you knew it was pure gold. Nowadays, they're just gold-plated. And fun fact, the gold medals are worth less than a 1000 bucks in terms of what their medal is actually worth. There's so little gold that an almost one-pound medal is hardly worth anything because there's just a little bit of gold now. But back then, they would bite them to see, is this real gold? I was going to demonstrate that for you this morning Unfortunately, I couldn't find my gold medal, so I, uh, I, I took the next best career athletic achievement, and I bit into it, uh, and the plastic <laughs> broke into my mouth, and so it was Madeira National Little League did not do me any uh, justice giving me a plastic medal. But you know, the, the Olympians that stand on the podium would be very disappointed. It'd be a severe letdown if having worked your whole life to achieve a gold medal and then to be handed a piece of plastic, to be given something that was not what they expected. And Olympians, whether they win or not, often feel a sense of letdown, regardless of whether they get a medal. Olympians struggle with reintegrating themselves into a normal life that does not involve training and competing every single day. That's what they've known for a long time, and a lot of Olympians have one set of Olympics, this one four-year event, that they can compete. They'll be too old by the time the next Olympics runs around, and so this is their shot. Their whole life has been pointing to this moment. And afterwards, they struggle with identity. Who am I now that I'm not competing and training for this Olympic event? But they're not the only ones that struggle. We often struggle with the same thing, asking the same questions. Who am I? What is my purpose? What am I doing with my life? Where am I going? Where have I been? What's the, the meaning of it for me? Today, I want to look at what Paul is going to give us in Philippians chapter 3, because he's going to give us a contrast. These things that do not satisfy, these things that do not bring joy, and he's going to contrast them with a life that does satisfy, with a life that does give joy. So if you've ever felt like, what am I doing? What is my life? Who am I? What is my purpose? I want to give you these two contrasts that Paul lists here in Philippians chapter 3. So let's read here, Philippians 3, starting in verse 1. He says, In addition, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write to you again about this is no trouble for me and is a safeguard for you. Watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evil workers. 
Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh, although I have reasons for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law of Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. But everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. And more than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. So Paul gives a, a lot here, and we're going to cover a lot, but I want to start in verse 1. Paul says, in addition, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. So he has kind of two parts here to the first verse, and he says, in addition, he's giving a new topic, but it's related to the previous topic. So he's saying, additionally, like, don't forget what I'm telling you. You still need to rejoice in the Lord. And then we'll get to his new topic that he introduces here in just a minute. And this here, rejoice in the Lord, has been Paul's repeated call to the, to the Philippian church since the very beginning of this letter that we've been going through. In chapter 1, verse 4, he says that he's always praying with joy for them in every prayer. It's a reminder to us that in our prayers, though we might be suffering, though we might be having trouble, Paul's in prison, that we can still pray with joy for others. And then in verse 18, Paul says, what does it matter? Speaking of the people who are preaching Christ out of selfish ambition and for the wrong reasons, Paul's saying, what does it matter only that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed and in this I rejoice. So when things aren't going our way, we can still rejoice. This isn't what Paul had in mind. It's not what he would have imagined. But even in this, he can still choose to rejoice. In chapter 2, verse 2, he says, Make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Paul's got this picture of Christian unity or Christian harmony, and that brings him joy. In chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, he says, But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, even if Paul is killed in this process, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. And in chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, For this reason, I am very eager to send him, that is, Epaphroditus, so that you may rejoice again when you see him, and I may be less anxious. Therefore, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and hold people like him in honor. It's a good picture of what Greg Kilgore preached two weeks ago on Epaphroditus, his willing sacrifice, his willing service to the people, though it could end up costing him his life. See, what Paul wants the Philippian church to know and what the Spirit of God wants us to know is that joy is central to the Christian life. When we repent of our sins and put our hope in Christ for eternity, for our salvation, that should bring a joy in us. A joy knowing that no longer am I damned eternally to hell, but now I have a hope of the resurrection. I have a hope of eternity with Christ. That's a joyful thing. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit, that the Spirit of God creates and brings about in our lives when we are Christians. James says that we should have joy in trials because our suffering produces ultimately joy. See, joy for us is a witness to the world. 
when as Christians we suffer, whether justly or unjustly for being a Christian, our response to suffering can be joy. Like Jesus said that the love that the church has for one another is an example to people who don't believe, so too Christian joy is an example to people who don't understand why suffering would cause anything except turmoil and anger and frustration. And repeatedly, Paul is saying, yeah, but have joy. But you don't understand, Paul. Like, my life is bad. Yeah, it's a good time to have joy. But things aren't going my way. Yeah, you can have joy. It's Paul's message to the Philippian church that the circumstances don't matter, only the response, the joy in those circumstances. So that's his first little connection there to the preceding verses. And then he says, to write to you again about this is no trouble for me and is a safeguard for you. So now Paul's ready to introduce a brand new topic. He says, I don't mind writing to you about this again. It's okay and it's a safeguard. It's a protection for you. It's a warning. And what Paul is going to tell them is there's no room for legalism in the church. A careful reading of the first two chapters will show you that this is not what Paul has talked about. And yet Paul says, to write to you about this again is no trouble for me. So what we would naturally conclude is that Paul had already written a letter at some time in the past to the Philippian church, warning them about this very topic. For whatever reason, it's still an issue. And so he's probably writing them another letter and saying, it's okay, I need to warn you about this again. I don't mind warning you about this again because it's important. It's something that you need to be safeguarded against. Legalism is the idea that doing something, obeying the law, in this case not our civil or legal system, but obeying the law that God has will bring about a righteousness. That is, being right, being just, being acceptable before God. So legalism means I try to do things that I think will make God happy with me. And based on that and that alone, I receive salvation. So legalism is the problem because it is saying, I'm in control of what God sees in me. I'm in control of whether or not God looks at me and says, I am worthy. I am justified. I am righteous. And what I want to note here is that in that, Paul's saying, I don't mind writing to you about this again. The very next verse, he's now jumping into this topic. Verse two, watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. If somebody called you a dog, an evil worker, a mutilator of the flesh, you would be right to take some offense at that. Paul here, you can feel Paul's anger and frustration here about this topic. Watch out for the dogs, the evil workers, and the mutilators of the flesh. The reason that Paul feels so strongly about this topic of legalism is it's a pervasive problem. It's a dangerous false gospel that's opposed to Jesus. It's a false gospel because like, you know, in Paul's day, it, the, the legal obedience was circumcision. They could circumcise themselves or be circumcised, and then that meant they were obedient to God. They did an outward thing and expected an inward cleansing. They expected that their actions would result in God's approval. It's a false gospel because it undermines the work of Christ. If I can do what I need to do to stand right before God, then I don't need the work of Christ on the cross because I can do it myself. 
And legalism says, you can do it yourself. If you're obedient to the law, you got this. You can do this. I'm righteous because of what I've done, not because of what Christ has done. The Bible says that there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. I can't mediate my own salvation with God. It's God in perfect heaven and me in imperfect, in every way, human, and Christ in the middle. And it's through Christ, Paul will say in a minute, that we have our righteousness. Legalism says, don't worry about Christ. You can just be good enough to do it. It's a false gospel. And Paul is saying they are dogs, evil workers. They're not even circumcising. They're just mutilating. It's a false gospel. And it also produces the wrong motives. It's good for us to want to do good works. The Bible says that from before the foundations of the earth, God had created good works for us to do. The Bible's full of good works. Jesus healed people. The apostles healed people. We see all kinds of good things throughout the Bible. But those good things done for the wrong reasons, with the wrong motives, become legalistic. When we do those good things and we then want to hold them before God and say, look, I've done good things, Therefore, you're obligated to accept me. Because I've done good things, you have to see me as righteous. I am justified because of what I've done. Part of the reason that that's a problem is because when we take those good things and do them for the wrong reasons, we start to become motivated by what that produces in us. Doing something good for the wrong reason gives us a feeling of, I've done something good, but God does not want our good works for our own sake. So when we present these good works to God, we feel good about it. I feel better when I do something good, and therefore now I'm driven by my feelings. I need to keep doing good things so that I'll continue to feel good. And the whole time God's saying, I don't want your good works. It's spiritual slavery that we subject ourselves to that I have to work and work and work endlessly to keep holding before God something that he doesn't even want. Legalism holds our good works before God with the wrong motives and demands that God expects them. Legalism also produces in us a false sense of security when we believe that these outward signs, these outward works are cleansing an inward problem, we miss the whole point. The outward doing, the tasks, however good they may be, can never cleanse us from our inward spiritual sin. But they give us a false sense of security. I'm a good person. I'm, well, I'm better than that person, at least. I may not be a good person, but when compared to a really bad person, I don't look so bad. So that's what I hold to God and say to God, I'm not a bad person. And it gives a false sense of security. It's like taking a trail of ants and wiping them off the counter and just assuming you don't have an ant problem. You have an ant problem if there are ants on the counter. You just can't see the problem. It's the same way Warren told me I had a better example and he gave it to me. He said it's like a check engine light on your car. The check engine light's on for a reason. Putting a picture of your happy, smiling family over the light does not make the light go away. You still have a problem. You just can't see it. When we are legalistic and we are trying to obey the law, we have a false sense of security because obeying the law will never make us righteous before God. Moses in Deuteronomy says, circumcision is of the heart. Paul says it in Romans 2, 28 and 29. He says, true circumcision is not something that's visible in the flesh, 
It's of the heart, by the Spirit of God. And what Paul is saying here is the problem with legalism is it's a false gospel that gives false hopes for the wrong reasons. And when people are led away into legalism, they do things thinking that they will be saved. And that is not how salvation works. There is no righteousness in our own works. You know, this is a, it's like a, a particularly pointed issue for Paul. You don't see this, this type of language from Paul or this attitude, if you will, from Paul. Most of the time, Paul is telling the churches, love one another. Even in First and Second Corinthians, like, hey, expel that immoral brother. But then Second Corinthians, like, all right, hey, you, you did it. He repented. Let him back in. Show forgiveness, show grace, be kind, be loving, be one family, put others' needs before yourself. Watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. This hurts Paul because Paul was that person. Paul was a Pharisee. And Paul's saying, watch out for that person. I know how destructive that person can be. That person comes in and they give wrong reasons. They give wrong gospel. They give wrong hope. Watch out for them. It's a problem that sneaks in easily. And Paul's trying to tell the Philippians, it's a safeguard for you. I don't mind saying this again. It's important And now he's going to transition kind of into this idea of what it means to have confidence in the flesh, to have a a confidence or a hope in and of ourselves. Look at verse 3. For we are the circumcision, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. That's a good person. That's somebody that Paul is admonishing and saying this is how we ought to be. In verse 4, he says, although I have reasons for confidence in the flesh. And now Paul's going to give his pedigree, his, his history of who he is. If anyone thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. Paul is listing here as if he were our modern day Michael Phelps. You know, Michael Phelps got 28 medals, 23 of them are gold. And Paul's saying, listen, if Pharisees got gold medals, I'd have them all. Regarding the law, the righteousness that is in the law, he calls himself blameless. Paul's saying, as far as I can see, I lived as perfect as a man can live in this Jewish law. Paul was a Pharisee, Acts 16 tells us. Paul was a religious leader. He had money. He had status. He had power. Paul was living the life socially and religiously that every Jewish person in his day dreamed about living. There was nothing that Paul had or Paul wanted or Paul could do or Paul could not do that other people would not look at him and say, that is what I want to be. Paul was living the best Jewish life that they knew how to live. And how ridiculous is it? How ridiculous is it that we're not much different? That we look at the money and the fame and the power, the prestige and the accolades and everything that comes with 
being rich or being famous or being well-known, and we just want that. But having that is never enough. There's never an amount of something that we get to and we say, I'm satisfied with this much money or this many followers or this many whatever. I'm not satisfied with this position. You see, for Paul, there was never an amount that ended his desire for more. There's always more Christians to persecute. There was always more law to follow. There were always other Jews to look down upon. There was never going to be a point where Paul said, I'm a good Jew and I'm satisfied. I can be done with competing in this event. There was always more. And it's ridiculous because we're the same. We want more. It's ingrained in our sinful nature that having what we have is not enough. It's thrown in our faces every time you turn on the TV, every time you open up a webpage. Here's somebody that has more than you. Here's somebody that's better than you. Here's somebody that's more attractive than you, that has the things that if you only had those things, then your life would be complete. And we've all been tempted in one way or another to look at that and say, yeah, if I had more, my life would be better. I would be happier. I would have joy. Michael Phelps won four gold medals at one Olympics. He said he went back to his hotel room and he didn't leave for four days. He said he fell into depression and was considering suicide. Sean White, the Olympic snowboarder, said, win or lose, I always felt empty. It literally didn't matter if I would win or if I would lose, I would always feel empty. A gold medalist received her gold medal and was walking back to the Olympic Village wearing her gold medal. And she said, as I got to cross the street, a truck was coming. And I wished the truck would swerve and hit me. Having more worldly achievements does not bring joy. It does not bring satisfaction. See, when our problem is putting confidence in the flesh, as Paul lists here, the only solution is to find our identity, to find our security, to find our righteousness entirely in Christ. Whether you're at the top socially or you're at the bottom socially, having more will not bring you joy. Having more, doing more, being more will not take away the need for righteousness that is apart from yourself. Look at how Paul describes all of those things. A Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee, zealous to persecute the church, blameless before the law. Listen to how he describes those things. But everything that was a gain to me all of those things, they are a gain. They have a privilege. Paul had an advantage. I considered to be a loss because of Christ. Do you hear what Paul's saying? I had it all. I wanted nothing. I lacked nothing. And it was worthless. I counted it as a loss. And then he doubles down on that. Look at the next verse, verse eight. He says, more than that. It's a Greek word, menage, which is like an emphasis. It's like, like when Jesus would say, truly, truly, I say to you. It's like Paul saying, listen, don't miss this part. First service told me to do that. 
that every once in a while I need to bang and wake people up. But Paul's saying, don't miss this. Listen, verse 8, more than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. It's all worthless when compared to Christ. All of the achievements, all of the status, all of the fame, all of the power, all of the money, everything is worthless if I compare it to having Christ. Because of him, I suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung so that I may gain Christ. See, when Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus, when he was going to persecute Christians, it was a ruthless reordering of Paul's life. He didn't just add Jesus like Jesus was flavoring to a great and near perfect life. Paul cut out his old friends. He quit his job. He moved to a new place. Everything from his old life was over. It's worthless. That's why Paul says, in Christ, we are a new creation. The dead is gone. Because when you have Christ, the new creation in you doesn't want that. It's worthless, Paul calls it. He had a problem. And his solution was to not find his identity there, but to find his identity, his security, and his righteousness in Christ alone. Can you imagine standing before God with all of the things that Paul had and laying them down, being like, you're welcome. It's like a buffet that you're like, I've made all of this. And it's like an exchange is what they would want to do. That's legalism. It's an exchange of, I've done all of these good things, therefore you give me righteousness because of these good things. It's like a monkey reaching into a cage and grabbing a banana and not being able to let go because it thinks it has what it wants, but it can't let go and so it can't get what it actually has. We are no better than the monkey striving and reaching for more and more and more only to take hold of it and find it's not actually what I want. Paul's saying when you take everything that you could even want and compare it to Christ, it's worthless. His whole identity was being a Pharisee. It's what Paul was. It's not even what he did. It's what he was. To give up everything that you know about yourself, everything that you are, everything that you do is a big deal. It's hard for you to say, I am a plumber. I am a farmer. I am a teacher. I am a parent, a mother. And to take all of those things that we will often say with, uh, with certainty, make us who we are, that these things give us identity. And to say, but none of those things really matter. Compared to having Christ, everything I know is worthless. Paul doesn't stop there, though. In verse 9, he wants to clarify what that means. What does it mean for him to have everything, to give it all up for Christ? It says, to gain Christ, verse 9, that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. Having everything, giving everything up, because of Christ, Paul then says, being found in Christ, but not because of my own righteousness from the law. It's the dogs. It's the evil workers. It's the mutilators of the flesh that are still trying to come in and say, if you do more, God will accept you. God's probably unhappy because you haven't done enough good things for him. But if you keep working at it, maybe one day you'll 
do enough things. Paul's saying, no, it's, it's not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. There's no way we can do anything that brings any kind of exchange of value to God. No moral goodness, no spiritual disciplines. You can't pray enough or give enough or serve enough or love enough. Nothing that we can do is an exchange that God will say, you now have your own righteousness. You are now good enough to come to heaven because of what you've done. Paul says, it's not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ underline and highlight through faith in Christ. You know, if you've been in church for a long time, like you grew up in church, this is critical for you because you live a pretty good life. You've eliminated those obvious sins. You don't do the bad things that you know were bad. You've tried to, you know, let the Lord sanctify you and Do what is right and not do what is wrong. Those are good things. That's what God calls us to do. But if you've been in the church for a long time, the way that legalism comes out in our lives is seeing someone brand new to the faith and looking at them and saying, yikes, that guy's got a long way to go. He's got a lot of sin. Well, at least it'll be easy to start checking those off the list. We look down on somebody because we're way beyond that. I don't deal with that stuff. I'm better than him. I'm righteous because of what I'm doing. If you've been in the church, if you've been a Christian for a long time, it's simply not true. It's pride. God accepts me through faith in Christ not because of what I've done, not because of the life that I've lived. God accepts me based on faith in Christ. Even that faith is the righteousness from God based on faith. The faith in God is not even mine either. The faith in God was given through God's righteousness Now, if you're new to following Jesus, if you haven't been in the church for most of your life, this is also important because you have to realize that you will never obey God well enough for him to accept you. It's just a foregone conclusion that one sin, one wrong thing, separates you eternally from God. You'll never be able to overcome that hurdle. A sin, a thought, you're done. No second chances. But through faith in Christ, God offers a way of salvation. Paul, one of the great Pharisees, could not even give anything to God that God would want. And God comes through Christ and offers it all freely. And through Christ and through the cross, God looks at us and he says, you can stand right before me. But only when it's mediated, only when it's before the cross. It's not on our own righteousness. It's when Christ has forgiven us for what we've done when we've repented of those things and said, man, that old life, the dogs, the wickedness, the mutilators, and I don't want to be that anymore. I turn and I go a different direction. I go where God has called. I follow what God has offered in salvation. And I say, I want to live a life that honors Christ. God offers salvation to us freely. No strings attached, 
No righteousness of our own needed. He just offers it to us. It's not by our good works that we're saved, because that would just make us more prideful. Now, Paul's kind of done with this idea of you've got the, the dogs and the, the flesh and the confidence in the flesh and him giving it all up for everything else. Now he wants to move on and kind of point us to what that means practically. Verse 10, he says, My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. This is negative now to positive. It's the external, the the legalists, to the internal of the heart. It's the present, and now Paul looking to the future. And he's saying, my goal here is to know Christ. I want to know him, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. And Paul uses a word, and the the CSB says, being conformed. The NIV and the, the ESV say, becoming like him. This doesn't simply mean to mimic, which is a word that we would kind of assume. And Paul's not telling us that he wants to be like Jesus in his death. He's not saying, I just, I hope I die so that I'll be like Jesus because Jesus also died. You know, when when infants start babbling, they mimic words. They mimic sounds. Babies just say things that sound familiar that they've heard. As they grow up, they become conformed. They become like their parents. You know, I see that in my daughters. I see them being conformed to my wife. It's a good thing. I hope they all grow up to be like my wife. My wife wants to be conformed to Christ. And so it's a pattern. It's a mold. And what Paul is saying here is that he wants through the fellowship of Christ's sufferings, to be conformed and be molded like Christ in his death. It's a a common Greek word that philosophers and writers used, and they used it to describe artists that would take a chunk of marble and they would start hammering away at the marble, and the marble block would be conformed to what the artist had in mind. What's really interesting about this word is it's what's in in the Greek, there's different tenses and participles. And this word is what's called a present passive. Present means it's ongoing and it doesn't have a a finite end point, which makes sense because we're constantly being conformed. We're never at that point of like, I've done it. I am now like Christ. So it's an ongoing process consistent and continual thing. It's present, but it's passive, which means the block of marble does not reach out with its marble arms and start chipping away at itself. Paul is not saying, I am conforming myself. It's what's called divine passive, meaning God is the one who is doing the conforming. So through the sufferings of Christ, God is conforming Paul forcing Paul into this mold to the likeness of Christ in his death. It's a big word which it tells us a lot about what Paul wants his life to be. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, that that Christ's sufferings might, through God's work, conform me to his death. Paul's giving up everything. And what he wants to replace it with is Christ's suffering and the likeness of Christ in his death. Service, sacrifice, a love for somebody else that doesn't benefit him. Paul wants those things and he says, assuming that somehow I will reach the resurrection from among the dead. It's this idea that Paul's not skeptical. He's not hesitant. He's saying he doesn't understand how it works. Like, I, don't, I don't get the mechanics of how I will somehow reach the resurrection of the dead. 
But Paul, throughout his writings, has a, a perfect confidence that whatever happens, he will reach the resurrection from among the dead. And it's because he's being conformed to Christ in his death. Verses 8 and 9 says he wants to know Christ, to gain Christ, to be found in Christ. To gain Christ, to know Christ, to be found in Christ is to be conformed like Christ. And Paul's goal here isn't suffering. He's not saying, I want to suffer. But rather, when I suffer, may I suffer like Christ. Something that we can all say amen to. I don't want to suffer, but when I suffer, may I suffer like Christ. Lord, we ask that we would be men and women who recognize the the seriousness of, of a life and a world that is so easily plagued by legalism. Lord, reveal to us in our own lives where we struggle, where we are tempted to think that we are better than or we are deserving. Lord, give us the hope of the resurrection that says that the foot of the cross, that we are all equal. We are all sinners in need of grace. That we have no righteousness of our own. That the righteousness that we have is through faith in Christ that the righteousness has been given by you, that we've all sinned and fallen short of your glory. And in your kindness, in your grace, you've given us what we don't deserve. You've offered Christ as our sacrifice. And in your mercy, you've withheld the judgment that we do deserve. And that's the righteousness that you've given us for which we are thankful Or during our time of communion, we ask that we would be remembering the sacrifice that Christ had, the sufferings that he endured. That my sin yelled crucify louder than the mob that day. Lord, may that be the suffering that we are conformed to. May it end in death, may it end in life, may it end in however you decide it ends. But Lord, may we see that our lives are reflecting the sacrificial serving nature of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Um, the first Sunday of every month, we take communion here at Grace Community Church. In the upper room before his betrayal by Judas, his denial by his disciples, his illegal trial, his suffering and death, Jesus told his followers to break bread and drink the juice in remembrance of him. Communion is for sinners like me, like you, who believe in Christ, have asked him to be their savior. So if you're not a believer or just not sure, just let it pass. However, if you're not a believer, um, we have these cards here that you can write, I want to know about Christ. Or you can tear up your bulletin now because we're done with it. So I want to know about Christ and put it in the back box there. Or you can interrupt any conversation that's going to be going on after church and say, I want to know about Christ, or tell me about Christ. That's okay. The elders say that's okay to interrupt conversations about that. <laughs> the Apostle Paul says that we are to examine ourselves, and in doing so, eat of the bread and drink of the cup, to judge ourselves rightly. How do we judge ourselves rightly? There's an example in Luke that the Lord gave. Two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. 
The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I pay tithes. I fast twice, twice a week. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. The Lord said, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Man, if you can come forward. We are only justified by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. He justifies all who wish to turn from their sins, confess with their mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in their heart that God raised him from the den, dead. The ransom for our sins has been paid. So as they pass the bed, please bow your heads, close your eyes, and just think of that sacrifice on the cross. Go ahead, pass the bed. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me, and I, I am desperate for you, and I. Lord said, this is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we prepare to pass the cup, it's time to look in the mirror and judge yourself rightly. This is for imperfect, sinful, sinful believers like you and me who blow it every day, every week. And I would encourage you, if you have, to go and make amends. Some of the most powerful words you can say is, I'm sorry, please forgive me, especially to unbelievers. Unbelievers. 
Sinners are saved by the Lamb of God's final and perfect sacrifice, which covers your sin. Many may pass the cup. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily breath. Lord Jesus Christ said, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant, my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us. And because you first loved us, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand for the Great Commission. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. God bless you. Go in peace. <laughs>